Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Dilbozer's Den. And today we will be discussing the newest release from Crip Sermon and their album, The Stygian Rose, released through Dark Descent Records. First and foremost, I'm not the most knowledgeable person when it comes to doom metal or things adjacent to that. What I know about doom metal is typically a blending of that, of the doom stoner genre, bands that are far more aggressive sounding, such as Conan, Thou, Paul Bearer, you name it, uh, Inter Arma. Those all kind of fall into the doom realm for me. But I also know that there is a litany of classic bands that fall into this area as well, such as Candlemath, Sirith Ungle, and Solitude Eternus. You know, you could even throw in bands such as like Merciful Fate or a lot of the new wave of British heavy metal bands. They kind of all fall into that. Doom kind of started with uh, Black Sabbath and probably the title track from the first Black Sabbath record. You know, you could even say that everything starts with Black Sabbath, but I digress. A lot of the Doom stuff that I think of just sounds like classic heavy metal to me. Sounds like any of the bands I just listed. If you look at their stuff, they probably grew up listening to aggressive hard rock from the 60s and 70s. And some of them probably even were listening to some of the blues artists prior to that or even during that same time. You look at a band like Cream. I'm sure a lot of influence came from all of that. But I say all of that to just let you guys know that Crip Sermon sounds like classic heavy metal to me. I know these guys probably draw influence from a lot of the Doom bands that they were listening to and that they're big fans of, but it just sounds like classic heavy metal to me. It's got all the aspects to it that would draw in a classic heavy metal record as opposed to maybe just a Doom metal record. And learning a little bit more about this band further than what I already assumed, I think the band was leaning a little bit more towards writing a classic heavy metal record. Thematically, song structure wise, and even uh, some of the memorable hooks and the catchiness of this album. To dig into this band a little bit, I became familiar with this band, I guess around 2019, with their prior release, The Ruins of a Fading Light. I was not the biggest fan of that record. It had all of the things to it that I should like, and I listened to it probably three or four times to get into it, and it just didn't quite catch on. And as we'll further learn that Maybe the band didn't have the best time with that album either. But what I've always liked to do is if I see something about a band that I like, and with this band, it's always been the artwork. Over to my left is the fantastic album cover for the Stygian Rose, which is done by the band's vocalist, Brooks Wilson. I'm always tied into it. I love the artwork to this. Definitely makes me think of some of their contemporaries or their modern contemporaries. Spirit of Drift being one that always makes me think of these big, grandiose pieces of art. Let's go ahead and dig into the lineup. As I mentioned, Brooks Wilson is the vocalist. He has also done the artwork for this record, the album prior to that, The Ruins of Fading Light, and their debut album. On drums, we have Enrique Sagranaga, and then we have on guitars, Steve Jansen and Frank Chin. And then on bass, we have Matt Knox. Matt Knox, if you guys aren't familiar, also does vocals and guitar in Death Weirdos Horrendous. This is Matt Knox's first full link with the band on bass. And he wasn't or isn't primarily a bassist. So uh, it's interesting to find out how well he plays and some of the things he does on this album uh, that draws it all together. Then on keyboards, we have Tanner Anderson, who has worked with bands such as Majesties, Holder, and Panopticon. On the recording side of things, the album was mixed, mastered, and recorded by Arthur Rizik, who is also a member of Cold World, Sumerlands, and Eternal Champion. Arthur has worked with bands as varied as Cavalera Conspiracy, Dream Unending, Judiciary, Municipal Waste, and Power Trip. Check out his uh, Encyclopedia Metallum. It's just a hellscape of great bands that he's worked with. As I spoke earlier, I became familiar with this band with their prior release, The Ruins of Fading Light, which was released in 2019. It just didn't catch on to me, and it felt like it drug on just a little bit. But upon reading into this band and digging a little bit more into the background of this band, the band itself wasn't too big of a fan of that album itself. It seemed the band was going through a lot of different things and everybody had different things going on in their personal lives. The band had even stated that they were under a little bit pressure to go bigger and more epic. And they did. You know, it's a longer record. It's a larger sounding record uh, than their debut. But the band went on to further say that felt a little bit bloated. You know, to me, it felt like a transition record. It felt like it was the next logical step from the band from their debut but it was also an album that got us ready for what this record is. After playing a few shows surrounding the Ruins of Fading Light, the band just kind of dissipated for a while. 
A few years later, the writing begins for the Stygian Rose. The band was, again, going through some hard times. It seemed like everybody had, again, some stuff going on in their personal lives. But when they all got together, they all agreed that they didn't want this to be the ruins of fading light. They wanted it to be something different. They wanted it to be more focused, more memorable, catchier even. Uh, I believe the phrase replay value was used quite a bit. And I can agree that this album, once I'm done listening to it, I want to listen to it again. It feels like that type of record. And that's a great thing for any band to ever want to put out is an album you can listen to and then listen to it again and again and again without feeling like I've had enough or you've had enough. The album itself has a theme or concept digging into early American spiritualism. And the center point is an individual, Pascal Beverly Randolph, who was alive from 1825 to 1875. He was a medical doctor and a multidisciplinary occultist and possibly the first sex magician. Look into all that. But he was also, adding to this, a free black man born during slave times, which brings a whole new vibe to this record, right? This person was a, an individual, and the research I did on this, he was very forward-thinking and has a lot of the same values that a lot of very open-thinking people have to this day. But let's dig into this record a little bit. This thing is fantastic. It sounds like a classic record already. It sounds like something you might have heard before, but maybe you just stumbled across is going, oh, what's this thing, this great sounding thing with all these different culminations of these classic bands and classic sounds that I love so much and grew up listening to. Let's get into the tracks on this album. Glimmers in the Underworld. Right out the gate, this thing sounds like a mashup of Sabotage and King Diamond. Maybe something off of King Diamond's Them or Abigail Records. You've got a great opening riff with this that repeats multiple times in the track to give it different feels. You have these great haunting keyboards that come in on this track, and then you get this great, fantastic, perfect, amazing riff at a minute and 23. Vocals immediately kick in, and it definitely brings vibes of Messiah Marcelone from Candlemass fame. And this may make a couple people scratch their heads, but it makes me think of like 90s James Hetfield, kind of the later era of the Black Album tours, and maybe even to the Load era. There's some natural grit in Brooks' vocals that he's honed in really well with. Not only does he have great grit, but he's got a great sense of melody. You've also got great bass playing all over this album, especially from somebody who doesn't consider themselves a bass player, and he is all over this record. It's tasteful. It's not overstepping anything, and it kind of cuts through like a knife in the mix. This opening track is definitely a great representation of what the rest of the album is going to sound like because you get all of these elements carried over into the five other tracks on the record. Every song has a fucking shredding guitar solo on it, and it doesn't feel like it's wank. It feels like they're perfectly suited for the album. It does seem like the band is meticulously combing through everything, although it's been stated that they don't do that. They're just that good. It just seems like they know their craft and they know what they want to hear. Kudos on all the guitar parts. I'm not a big solo guy. I think they kind of get in the way, but in an album like this, they play in so well. We get into our next track, which is Thunder Perfect Mind. This is probably one of the more straightforward tracks on the album. It's a very mid-paced song. It has these great opening layered guitar harmonies all over the beginning of it. it gives you this kind of Egyptian slash Middle Eastern vibe with some of the harmonies and the guitar tones on here. Again, another song that makes me think of Load Era Metallica. Great mid-paced heavy track, vocal melodies all over it. The choruses are big on this album. You can remember everything. I have different parts of different songs that get stuck in my head daily. Great, straightforward, just mid-tempo song. Uh, the band doesn't really get extremely fast. You know, the first track is pretty fast and upbeat, but usually it's in this mid-tempo kind of vein, which is very akin to classic new wave of British heavy metal and some of the classic doom bands that these guys are into. And I, I want to bring up too that the keyboards on this album are very tasteful. They're almost used like a piano and there are some different textures and sounds here. But again, it's just there to set the vibe and the keyboards on the end of this track are absolutely perfect. We go into track three, which is Dawn in the Hollow, which again starts out with a great synth opening, 
kind of gives an eerie dissonant vibe to it with some of the clean guitar parts. And then it kicks right into what sounds like to my ear, a John Christ style guitar part. And John Christ is most famous for being on the first four Danzig records. He's part of that classic lineup. Primarily sounds like the first three records in there. This is also where I really started to notice the new wave of British heavy metal sounds, a la Merciful Fate. I don't spend a lot of time talking about drummers, but I want to bring up Enrique's kind of parts in the chorus on this. There's these wild fucking cymbal parts and these fills in the chorus on this track. And the choruses on this album are big. They're massive. They're hooky. They get stuck in your ear. They're an earworm. They're almost despicably catchy. And I hope that was the goal with this album because it's all over it. Every single track has a great hook, a great chorus. You know, again, we go back to the riffs, which is what we're here to talk about. You know, at 359, you have this great kind of speed riff that's going on, and it leads right into this mosh riff at like four and a half minutes. right into the chorus and then it's back to just a total shred fest to kind of play the song out another more straightforward track from the band and then we get into track four we're going to the b side of the record which is heavy as the crown of bone which is one of the most memorable tracks on the record the intro has this stellar bass guitar interplay that's going on the riff at 50 seconds in reminds me of where the slime live with all the drum stabs and all the drum hits and everything who knew i'd be making a morbid angel reference on an album like this especially with it being from domination and maybe not from the first three records For someone who isn't primarily known as a bass player, Matt Knox does a stellar job on this record. This song in particular really highlights how he plays. You know, I've brought up the load era, Hetfield kind of references for the vocals, but there's a point on this track that sounds like it's it's that era in particular. Right at the 155 minute mark, you'll hear it. And, you know, if you're not familiar with that album, if you hate it, uh, you can at least know what I'm talking about when I mention that. Of truth and of divine It speaks of karma wisdom with no shame Bring me the chains I can handle the pain In the dark I can swear I saw her spider smile I can hear the angel say The First portion of the bridge sounds like human era death. You know, it sounds like Steve DiGiorgio playing lines and all these hyper melodic things that are going on with it. And it goes right into this kind of shred solo fest from the other guys in the band. And again, tastefully done, very well pointed. This is also the track where I noticed that the song structures are very, they're very engaging. They're wild without seeming out of this world and just disjointed. They seem very linear, but they're not. On to what has to be my favorite track on the album, which is the Scrying Orb. Probably the most melodic track on the album. Has the catchiest vocal hooks, and they're not overdone in the, the song. They're not just beaten to death. I love the lyrics on this. I love the concept behind it. It's definitely my favorite song on the record, and the record has had repeated spins for me. It opens up with this great keyboard line intro that makes me think of the middle part of Entomb's Left Hand Path, which is the phantasm melody, right? Just that same vibe. It, and it even evokes that same eerie calm. Bass playing, I'm a bass nerd. 
I've been playing bass for 20 plus years and Matt Knox does a fantastic job on this record, as I've mentioned before, but he definitely is evoking some Geddy Lee and Geezer Butler influences on this track. As I mentioned before, the chorus, the vocal melodies on the chorus, the lyrics on the chorus are probably the highlight of this said track, and they're not done to death. It doesn't sound cheesy. It doesn't sound hokey. It's done the way a hook should be done, which allows it to stay in your head and constantly remember it and want to go back and listen to this over and over again. Listening to this album multiple times in a row and not getting tired of hearing this track or that vocal line says a lot. In this track, which is kind of a ballad, which could be a ballad, or the closest thing the band gets to a ballad, you end this track on a fat fucking riff that sounds like Psalm 9 Trouble or even Down's Nola a little bit, which you could kind of blend both of those because I'm sure Down is influenced by Trouble. Great riff to end a perfect song in my eyes. And then we go into the final and self-titled track, The Stygian Rose. This is the epic track on the record. And this is probably the most traditional Doom style track because there's not, to my ear, there's not a ton of traditional riffage on here. It's more about the vibe and the mood that it sets across all 11 or so minutes of it. I will say, though, as riffs, starts out with another great piano, synth intro, Tanner knows what he's doing when it comes to keyboards, synths, pianos, and how to make it an instrument that can stand out without overstepping its bounds. Sometimes keyboards don't get mixed very well. I feel like the piano stuff is mixed really well on this record, whereas I think the synth stuff isn't mixed as well. It's just kind of laying under it, but that's just a personal preference. I would like to hear it a little bit more in the mix, but then again, with how things are mixed, sometimes you have to sacrifice one thing to make everything else uh, come to the forefront. The first riff on this sounds like Crack the Sky era Mastodon. The arpeggiated kind of minor chords that are coming in there with these big chunky power chords on top of that. There's almost a Halford-esque baritone vocal style that Brooks is doing in here. The, the dude's a great vocalist, and he's came into his own on this album. I think with the prior release, he was still figuring out what he wanted to do. On the third record, he's found it. This is his thing. This is how he sounds, uh, the way he harmonizes, the way he layers his vocals, the different tools he keeps in his belt when it comes to his vocals. He can do so much, and he is doing a lot. This is a great anthemic, epic track to end the album out. The keyboards at the end of this make me think I'm playing Castlevania on the Super NES all over again, or I'm playing Castlevania 64. I think when it comes to a band like this, Comparing them to maybe classic Doom bands isn't what comes to my mind. It makes me want to compare them, and they're their own band, but it makes me put them in the same vein, I should say, with modern, old-school sounding bands, right? Modern bands that do the old-school thing but do it so well, a la Spirit Adrift, Tribulation, the first Ghost record in particular. Those are this band's contemporaries to me. Crip Sermon, The Stygian Rose, fantastic album. Definitely going into my year-end list. Check it out. Let me know what you think of the record. Check out the Riff Worship podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and X. We have new episodes dropping every Wednesday. Let me know if there's anything you'd like me to review. If there's anything that I missed, if there's something that I missed about this band. But if not, the Stygian Rose, Crip Sermon, check it out. What's up?